Hi, this is Rich with Insight HPC. We're here at the Stanford HPC conference, and uh, today I'm here with Thomas Thurston from WR Hamburg. Thomas, thanks for coming on the show today. Hey, thanks for having me. Well, Thomas, let's just start at the beginning. Who is your company and, and who do you help out there in the VC space and the startup world? Yeah, so I'm CTO of WR Hambrick Ventures, which is a venture capital firm uh, founded by Bill Hambrick, who was an early investor in Apple and Google and Intel and a lot of the big technology firms in Silicon Valley. Um, what I think is uh, personally interesting about our fund, I've been there uh, a little over 13 years. And there's a couple of things, you know, one is of course this legacy of, of really being able to find disruptive companies at the firm. Uh, but secondly, since I've been there, I lead a eight person data science team and we actually use big data and AI uh, and an analytics platform we built called Mies to find the startups that we invest in. Okay, okay. And, and what was that, what, what was your talk gonna be about today at the Stanford conference? Were you gonna show how that data science works? Yeah, my hope at the conference is really just to share what we've been working on. And I think we've had a lot of breakthroughs, but also to explore the limitations where we're running into trouble and try to provide as balanced as possible a look at how analytics are helping uh, venture capital and really changing the way we do our investing, but also where the frontier is and the cutting edge that we're trying to push through. Well, Thomas, I wanted to ask you something about an earlier interview we did. Uh, it said that you don't need to know the company the management or the technology to determine if a comp if a company is worth investing in, how is that possible? Yeah, yeah. Well, so um, we really have a three step investing process, and the first two steps are both driven by analytics. Um, so the first thing we do is we have an analytic system that's really good at using vast proxy data to figure out uh, estimate what the company's valuation is and what kind of growth trajectory it's on. And so if a company doesn't have at least a certain amount of value and the certain growth trajectory, we won't even consider it for our portfolio. So the first pass is just, is it winning amongst its peers in the marketplace uh, based on the value it's creating and its growth? Um, once a company has made it past that phase, and typically only one or 2% of companies usually do, um, we have a second set of simulations that we run where we actually use an HPC styled simulation engine uh, that we built to model what it would be like when that company goes into the market and competes with its competitors and really form a large actuarial understanding of the odds that that startup will hit our investment goals in our time frame, taking those externalities into, into account. And if a startup makes it past that phase and has good enough odds for our portfolio, um, then we do regular due diligence, just like any other firm. So we eventually get around to looking at the team and the technology and all of those qualitative things that everyone would hope we look at. Um, but we don't even do that at all unless a startup makes it past the first two um, algorithmic gates. And what we find is it helps us find the winner much faster. We can source hundreds of deals a day globally and cherry pick out those ones that are winning um, and fit the, the theme of our portfolio. And Thomas, you talk about this idea of comfort zones that VCs tend to stay in their, in their own little area. Uh, what about HPC, for example? Um, are there special considerations? I mean, you know the market as well as any others. Well, what do you think? I think HPC is an especially challenging place to, to start a new business, to be honest with you, because yep. you're competing at the high end of the market and it doesn't take a, an algorithm to realize that the biggest companies with the most resources tend to dominate the high end. And you don't see as much turn up there, right? You see the big players at the top of the chain and you don't see a lot of movement over time. Um, but for example, we, we try to look at anything that's really changing or potentially disrupting uh, HPC or, or high-end computing or enterprise computing over the long term, And we try to look for cracks that might create an opportunity for a new company to come in. Um, so for example, when edge computing started to, to look really interesting to us uh, a couple of years ago, um, we didn't know the extent to which it may or may not be a disruptive shift in the market, but it was different and uh, kind of moving somewhere in between the cloud and on-prem might create an opportunity for new startups to come in and enter. Um, so for example, we modeled uh, over 700 different companies in the edge computing ecosystem. Uh, we found about a small handful that actually were really interesting and showing interesting growth. Um, and, and so that's, um, that's an approach that we took. But, but I do think that uh, it, it, you do see disruptions happening in HPC, but, but they're very hard and they're very rare. 
And, and what I hope gives us an advantage is to see who's winning when a lot of the other investors stay inside of their comfort zone, which is typically their, their qualitative understanding of the, the, the people in the industry and their sort of gut intuition about which technology may or may not become disruptive. And what we found is our intuition, um, no matter who we speak with or how smart we try to get, it is just a person's guess. And you get five smart people in a room and everyone could disagree till the end of their career uh, based on which technology is going to win in HPC. Um, so what we do at our firm is we, we thematically look at interesting areas and then we just use the analytics to see who is winning. So it's not about whether or not we think it's the best technology. It's about whether they are in fact winning in the marketplace and can we detect them before anybody else. Well, Thomas, we're in this world of upheaval with the COVID virus. Will you have to go back and reset uh, and rerun these models or change your algorithm or have you looked at that yet? Yeah, our algorithm is dynamic and um, a lot of the inputs are fluid. And so th there's uh, some of the data is real time, so we don't have to update it, so to speak. We just keep running the models. But there are certain things that we test against that we have to train very aggressively. Um, and, and obviously those things have all changed in the last two weeks. <laughs> so uh, we have seen some changes in our models um, and, and uh, being able to get that data, see how those changes affect us is an important thing to do. But um, yeah, it, it's been a busy two, three weeks and uh, the models today look very different, especially in terms of valuations of startups than they did just you know less than a month ago. Yeah, I mean, uh, as a, you know, somebody with a 401k, I'm looking for good news, Thomas. <laughs> You think there's going to be a lot of opportunity when we come see the light of day after this? Uh, we have vaccines and such, and we can move on. Yeah, I, I think it's going to affect different companies in different ways, uh, and and that's not a very helpful answer. But uh, for the last year and a half, we, we've really focused in healthcare at Hambrecht. So our focus has been particularly around diagnostics in healthcare, um, and so that portfolio is actually just, I mean less by strategy and more by luck uh, is doing really well right now because early diagnostics are especially important in a time of a pandemic. And a number of those companies have actually seen a boost um, in the last few weeks because of that shift where diagnostics wasn't considered very sexy or cool by the healthcare community uh, a couple months ago, uh, but now it's, it's extremely important. And especially being able to use big data to do early detection of disease uh, we have a number of investments in that space, and those have become very, very important, um, even more so in the last few weeks uh, than the trajectory they were on. So we've seen strong upticks there. So there's an example. We just happen to be in the right portfolio for, for a pandemic uh, in, in kind of a morbid way. Um, but other, other types of, you know, obviously anything in the service sector, a lot of luxury consumer types of innovations um, are going to be harder hit, if, depending on the extent of this downturn. So I think... Um, Substantively, though, it does create upside for some players where it's more of a stress on others. Well, how are you holding up there? You're up in the uh, Seattle area? Uh, you, you yeah. Know, so I live on Bainbridge on? Island. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, I, you know, I can't see any neighbors to my left or right. So I, we're already pretty uh, isolated. As a data scientist, I, I'm naturally inclined to be socially isolated anyway. <laughs> so, but, um, but our team is, is already, everybody works from home. Um, so thankfully, it hasn't disrupted business too much. But I, but I do think, um, in an ironic sense, uh, this this emphasis on analytics has really been uh, helpful when when you can't fly anywhere, right? When all of a sudden you you have to be socially distant and and you, you can't get on airplanes um, because the ability to sit at our terminals and look at hundreds of startups around the world to see who's winning or losing or how the recession is is affecting them if it's going to be a recession. Um, has been really helpful when a lot of my colleagues are, are stuck at home trying to figure out what to do um, and where even if they have capital to deploy, they, they can't go out there and take a bunch of interviews and place, uh, you know, and interview a bunch of startups for who invest in. So um, depending on the, the depth and length of this, um, it, it has actually played to our to the benefit of analytics. Um, but, you know, uh, we, we can't get on airplanes either. So th there is a time when that becomes an issue. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you brought that up, Thomas. You know, I have a publication inside Big Data, and some people have said, well, that 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 whole notion is kind of past. It, it sounds to me like there is a bright future for analytics. Would you agree? I, I hope so. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> I think so. Look, I mean, the world's not done learning. And um, the more we learn, it's like the expanding balloon. The more we realize we don't know. And uh, so I... <laughs> 
I'm optimistic, uh, both intellectually as well as uh, for the sake of self-interest. <laughs> but I think um, you know there are plenty of mysteries to find out there, and I don't know a better way than data to try to attack, attack those at mysteries. Well, terrific. Well, Thomas, I want to thank you once again for coming on the show today, and I hope uh, the best for your health and your family. <laughs> And uh, we will see you on the other side of this pandemic, I'm hoping, real yes. soon. Stay safe. You Thanks. bet. See you later.